<laughs> Somebody's still talking. <laughs> Please leave Thanks. the room. Yeah. Greetings. Greetings. Grove uh, Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, Pancake Tuesday. So you'll all be sure to come around. There's one thing I must do before we do anything else. I owe a great apology to two people who gave came out as life members, and I forgot to record it. And Mr. Sawley, will you come up here, please? You know, Nina is not with you, but this is really to make amends for really having screwed up something rather badly. Because his very good friend Nina bought a life membership to him for Christmas. I'm sorry that Christmas is too late. And if you want to convey these to Nina, I would appreciate it. I am so sorry, and I apologize very, very much if I can do that. I really do apologize. I, I, when I screw up, I do it in style. Thank you very much. Greetings, I welcome you. Mr. Sawley's father, very touch. He's responsible for a lot of what you're sitting in right now, right? Absolutely. He's one, one of that original group that put this place together. One of that that group of brain trust there at the right time. So, thank you very much, and we thank you for the very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, you have a few words. Please. A special meeting of the Linfield Historical Society was held at the meeting house on November 18th in light of renewed interest in preserving old houses with a program from the Cummings Art Project of Ipswich. Before the presentation, President Harris noted the passing of Pamela John Hall earlier in the week. The secretaries and treasury reports were given and accepted. A request for help at the upcoming, upcoming country store was made, especially for greens and baked goods, and extra freezer space for the large quantity of baked beans. Edie Richard and her committee provides for the hand bean table. Mr. Harris also mentioned the gift of a computer from Dr. Neal to the Historic Commission and a large donation to the Meeting House Restoration Fund from a charitable group from New York, Manton Group. The President then introduced Matthew Cummings and Jim Wynn, Ipswich architects who presented their programs featuring slides of several before and after house restorations from Ipswich and environment. Ipswich having an unusual number, over 50 first period restorations from the early 1700s, with several streets still encompassing the original layout of roads. At the conclusion of the program, persons were served by several male members of the society. <laughs> Respectfully <laughs> submitted Jane Green. Thank you. Any uh, errors or remissions? <laughs> well, you emotionally accepted. I did, it just hasn't shut off yet. Oh. I'm trying to shut the fan off, that's all. Well, Mr. Colton, uh, Treasurer, can you give us a brief rundown on where we stand financially? Please. Okay, very quickly, uh, the uh, coming score, final profit, is $3,863.21. We did quite well. It was better than the year before, slightly. So that was very nice. Uh, this year, so far, we've been going along very well due to some very lovely uh, uh, gifts that have come in by way of our good president. Don't, don't point me out. Well, I, I'm pointing you out. Right. You're the guy that there brought in the 15,000 from the Manton thing and hit the local banks for money. So we did very well with that. 
So our income so far is $73,658 and change. And our expenses so far, since we have redone the painting and so forth, finished the building up a little bit, is $63,724 and change, giving us so far a profit of $9,933 up to this point in the year. We're doing quite well. Uh, we were about to say something. I was going to ask for questions. I forgot the other sheet. The one that gives us tells us how much we have. <laughs> well, we have roughly two hundred and three thousand. Two hundred and three thousand. Um, as we said, if I make this in the pause a little bit, uh, in our meeting we had a board meeting last night, and basically on our investments, we've lost about what seven percent. Is not bad since stock market went down 50 percent. So. Very good. This is the key seven percent. Guy named Madoff helped us out. Madoff, you drew the Madoff money out. Well, How early? <laughs> Any um, comments or? That's extraordinary. That's what it is. Excuse me, sir. That's extraordinary. You raise all that money. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would point out that our treasurer is not of the accounting fraternity, but is an engineer. <laughs> Matter of fact, when we talk about the Manson Foundation, when I wrote to New York to say, give us some money, they said, send back your budget. And I said, we don't have a budget. But I'll give you the last three reports. And I said, I caution you. That our treasurer is an MIT graduate, <laughs> which means that it was done in a not in an accounting fashion, which you can't read or one you can read. Yeah, uh, more we thank you, and four ladies. Would you like to stand up? No. <laughs> Shirley, Beth, Millie, and Linda, thank you very much for the repast. What are you going to? No, that's a All right, well, You're welcome. we thank you very much. And anybody else who would like to be honored next month, then please let Linda know, and you can sit over here. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we do need some help as we go along. And Linda's very good about rising them up. Can we just ask for a volunteer right now? Yeah. Um, we can, but, um, well, let's put it this way. Yes, if anybody knows right now, will they... I'm going to put this way, but please see you before you go home. Don't let me down now. Please see her before you go home. And that, it doesn't, not a lot of heavy, heavy lifting, but you, get, you get, do get pointed out, honored at the beginning of the show, and you get to bring a little of your home. But I have a whole uh, a list of things you need to do and how to do it and everything. It's very easy. It's just, it's, yeah. All right. It's not hard, is it? Yeah. Good. <laughs> We had a board meeting last night. Very quickly, as far as money is concerned, you know, we got a grant from the Essex National Heritage Commission for $4,500. They gave us $4,500. We matched it with something like $7,000 um, to um, get the report on the building, the historical report. You were here when Finch was here. And also, we, had a, we have a man who will be a speaker in, the, I think, April. Yes, an excellent speaker with particular company is in the matter of, of the engineering restorations. And he's going to run a program on restorations he's done. In some of the pictures I've seen, you see scaffolding underneath big buildings and so on and so forth. But um, that report has been very good. It's not really finished yet, but we did get our full 4500 from the Essex National. The Manton Foundation, the one in New York, and Evan pointed out, and pointed out very briefly, we requested 136,000. We gave it 52,000. <coughs> because the 52,000 covered a schedule which was given to them of work. And the schedule, the work we wanted done right now, this quarter, was we put in 25,000 for painting, we put in 8,000 for the wood, for repairing woodwork, restoration. And 11,000 for a drain board or a round building, and 6,000 for a handicap ramp, which we should really have. 
and there's a couple of thousand consultants. And to date on that, as Evan pointed out, we've actually spent in the painting, we've still got some done, some left to do. George is doing the inside of the building of the windows. They have to be done. The outside was done, they have to be done. But uh, we spent about 43,000 of that. So we got about 9,500 left from that particular fund to account for doing the rest of the, doing the, the ramp and the, and a, a border. We have to have a grain border around. We want it to be a good one. No point in doing something that's half baked. So we'll have to see. But we got also gifts beyond that. Harriet Hope, we thank you. We thank you for the time. We never, never did it enough for the thousand dollars you gave us to work this effort. And also we got a thousand from the Wakefield Co-op and four thousand from the savings bank. So <clears throat> anybody knows of good sources for more money? We need it. I read only a little bit of a letter which we got from the Manhattan Foundation saying, here's your money. <coughs> and this, there is a sentence in here that says, the trustees are particularly interested in hearing about any additional locally based, locally based donations that may have been leveraged by the foundation's grant. Consideration of any future proposals. In other words, go back and talk to us. If you want. Consideration of any future proposals will be contingent upon the demonstration that greater local support has been secured for the restoration project. Uh, you think we can get 30,000, 40,000 out of the townspeople? I'm not going to ask for it from the budget. Out of the townspeople. Uh, well, everybody in the town gives a dollar. That's 12,000. Every land, every homeowner, get $10 out of every homeowner. Every household, you know, every resident, I think it's 44,000 residents. What's that come to, 40,000? I don't know whether you can do it or not. Anybody got any good ideas or want to get out and scramble for money? Because this building, I don't care what they say, when your house, or when anybody buys a house in Linfield, you can be pretty sure that the real estate people drive them by the meeting house and point it out. So it is a great value for town just for that reason, but nothing else. Uh, <clears throat> left, work left to do on uh, lights and electricity <clears throat> and some other stuff. But the electricals and the lights have to be worked on. They're going to take some work. We've been working on a new brochure. The historical center is getting into shape pretty well. We're working very closely with the historical commission. And we're getting a file to we thank our own librarians and the commission people for working with us. And that place will be uh, in quite good shape where we can keep all our stuff and people can go in there and get information on Linfield. Uh, I said two minutes on the CPA. You want to do it? Yes, here. <laughs> but only two minutes. Because when it comes down, I, you want me to do your speech for you? Uh, uh, you do it. <laughs> You're too long. I'll do it for you. Speak from there. Speak of us. You're, this is the chairman of the commission, and... Wait, one thing we have coming up, um, as you know, we passed the demolition delay bylaw, which is a great thing for our town. We have the Community Preservation Act coming up for your vote in April. As you know, it's a surcharge on your property tax with uh, exemptions for the first $100,000 of your assessment. The second is for a moderate income seniors and for Linda, moderate income, low, low income, low, low income. income. What will this 3% surcharge will get for us is funds in, uh, with match, uh, our funds plus matching funds that come from the registry of deeds. Every time a deed or a lien is recorded, that money goes into a fund and it's matched. Yes, or the matching amount is going down because of the economy, et cetera. But if we get next year, if the grant is 35%, that's 35% we didn't have before. And for the average homeowner, the amount, because it's a federal tax deductible, is only about $125 for the year. We could get back a great amount of money for the meeting house for uh, historic preservation and for keeping our archives and objects and, and 
The other two things are for open space and for low income. When is the election? Hmm? When is the election? April 13th. Oh, April 13th, yeah, April you're 13th. asking. Get out and vote if you're in favor of it. Yes, if you're not in favor of it, stay home. Stay home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Call someone on the commission and we'll explain a few questions. Please feel free to call anyone on the commission because we're all voters. Yeah. And it, yeah. and we can get up to 80% of that Maybe money. Two minutes are up. 70% of that point money for, uh, The point is to get to the election. Sorry. Yeah. This. Please, vote yes, please. It's a, it's a boon. And as Dawn's looking for grants and other sources of money, when you have the Community Preservation Act, you already have a matching grant. So when you're sending out a grant... What's the name of the bunny with the bar battery in it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ever ready. Uh, it, we'll remember you for that. It uh, helps us. Thank you. I'm not being yeah, okay. too, too much. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, though. Uh, next month is traditional Linfield night on the end of March. And uh, we've called back our police fire chief. This time, instead of giving us murders in Linfield, he's going to give us arsons in Linfield. And he's free to uh, arson in Linfield. And he's free to talk about arson in the neighboring communities. Uh, if you run out of Linfield, you go to Peabody. And probably, I'm sure we might have a file on Glenn. And a few in Wakefield, who would, well, you don't want to talk about the one in Wakefield, wasn't that a fireman that did it? Was he asked him? Policeman. What? Policeman. He was a policeman. Oh, well oh, that makes it all right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, and then beyond that, um, Mrs. Mrs. Richard uh, will talk about her life as a pope. How's that? <laughs> and Linfield and, and Earl is going to talk about it. I don't know it yet. I just put a book this on. I want to be able to describe what it looked like when they pulled down this beautiful old farmhouse to make way for the Summer Street School. I'm not, I wonder today what we have done with that. The school was going to go in there. But it's rather interesting to hear what was there when they pulled it down underneath the boards. And finally, unless somebody else comes up, you now I talked to myself. I talked about the selectman that was hung in effigy on the common, and I had to tell you last year, I couldn't find the answer. We know it was done, I couldn't find the answer. So this is the second edition. I might be able to string this out for about five years, but I've got to go through the papers. And we're pretty certain we know who it was, but the time when it was, I don't know. But the ones that that remember it, all they can remember is something. Someone was hung in effigy on the common. It was done, but we didn't have it. Now, I'm trying to think of your name. No, that's all right. I'm just getting my breath. Chief Romano, would you like to introduce our speaker for the evening, please? The speaker tonight is Mr. Bill Conway from the city of Lynn. Bill is a past president of the Lynn Historical Society and he retired. His last job was the chief of the fire department in the city of Lynn. His topic is uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, this will be the third time that I've seen it. Um, and I know that nobody here is old enough to remember having to use ice in an ice box or ice <laughs> <out of sleep. laughs> Or any of that. And I'm sure nobody knows that they used to harvest ice on Pillings Pond or Reedy Meadow. You're, you're not old enough for that either. But you will enjoy Bill's presentation, and it's a, a real honor to have him here. Bill? It's very appropriate that the eve of Ash Wednesday have two firefighters here talking to you. The program I have is they call the Harvesting Ice. It was actually harvest. Harvest here in the old days, the farmers were in the off season. We had to the ice for the cover. What I'll be showing you tonight is how it's done and showing you it being done. And what happened in most of the slides are from Lynn. What happened on Lynn happened everywhere. In the field, every place in the state. So I hope you enjoy the work. We have one catastrophe so far. My first projector, the ball burned out. So I don't have a spare. <laughs> Speak up now, Tom. Shall we? 
this is a an illustration which turned your eyes back in 1964. It shows how the ice was cut in a very beautiful small scale. The ice was cut with a lot of hard work. Long hours. Usually the ice was harvested this time of year, the end of February, early March. That the biggest enemy of ice was snow. Snow would insulate the ice, it wouldn't get thick. Or thick enough to cut. A rule of thumb, the two inches of ice would hold the hand, four inches would hold a hoss, and five inches would hold a hoss in the grip. So the ice had to be at least five inches thick before they even started working on it. The ideal thickness for ice would be anywhere from 14 to 16 inches. they used to harvest the ice, what they call a scraper in a plow. You might think the name's reversed. This here is called the scraper. Some were pulled by horses, mostly by horses, some by men. This would remove the snow from the ice. You can see the snow banks and the shores of the pond. Okay, this was called the, uh, the scraper. Another tool they used this one be a Another tool they used was what they call a plow, which to me is reversed, but this was a plow. This would put a gouge in the ice, and maybe probably 16 inches or so apart. It would start off by lining it up on one side of the pond, and eyeball a tree across the pond, and head for it with one cut, and cut a groove maybe two inches thick. On a return trip, they would put one of these rails in that groove they made and cut the other grade, the other groove. So they always had the same width of ice. And this would cut about two inches the first time. They would cut and eventually about uh, three quarters of the thickness of the ice. Can we ask questions if we don't want? Yeah, if you don't want the answers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going back a little, what was that, a saw? The saw blades underneath? No, it was like a big blade. It wasn't, it wasn't the teeth in it, it was like a, almost like an ice skate. I'll show you one later on. Uh, I'm surprised it didn't fall in. Well, the ice had to be five inches thick. You see they make it in rows in one direction, then they come back and make it in the other direction. I mean, this is one hot spot, and they cut the other, all this is This is what the machine looked like. Yeah. See, it has like teeth in it. We would cut the ice and keep going back and forth to about three quarters of the thickness of the ice. This is our sluice and our flax pond lid. This is Lakeview Avenue back here. Most of the pictures they have are of lid. These are saws. They used to always use a saw too. They would saw big chunks of these ice here and float them back into the ice house and make a canal or a channel and let the ice float in there. gentlemen here, this is again, this is Black Spawn, this is Maple Street over here. But they would cut all the types, you know how straight it was. They cut large chunks of it off and float it back to the ice ops. And later on, I'll show you that. What's the this approximate is, date? Once again? The date. Well, we're on the turn of the century, early 1900s. This is a saw that was in the collection of the historical society. So one man saw it after the other guy began to water. So we're right <laughs> And they would cut the ice off. Hey, this is a power one. Uh, the potion was around today, they'd probably die and kill you. No protection in these plates. This is like an old car motor here. It was pushed again, hit your hand driven here. And you should just cut the ice. In the back here is an ice house. This is on a sluice pond. This had to call a vertical lift to lift the ice up from the, from the water level up to any storage height they had. This is one of the operations of the power saw. Again, on sluice blocks. They scored the ice in these small blocks and they cut larger blocks with that saw. And you can see how even it was. And they float them off into the ice house. Again, this is sluice, this is a flash block. We also had a tool, it's called a pipe pole. 
And these pipe balls could be anywhere from six feet to 18 feet in length. And they would use it to push or pull the ice. This is one from the Linux Torture Collection. They use a pointed end to push and a curved end to pull. Yeah, anywhere up 18 feet long is this uh, barbecue. They scored all the ice and they cut it into lots of sections and they would float it back to the ice house. This one here is being done manually. The guy with the pipe pole. This shows horses doing it. They have horses. Now this one here, the guy is pushing the ice away from the shore so it won't bend it against the edge here. To float down to the ice house. This is a flax pond. You can see the main canal here. They float the big planks of ice down into the ice house and float it up to the ramp into the ice house. You get the postcard about this bean tonight. Some of you uh, suggested reading was the American Iceman, one of the books. In the American Iceman, one of the pages, Frederick Fuda was a Boston prison man who summoned in the hatch. And he invented a system that to preserve the ice and ship it all over the country. Mostly he used sawdust, uh, hay, and stuff like that. You notice. Somewhere it says you didn't pond in mid Massachusetts is where you get a snack and it's one of the best ice. Mm -hmm. He said he had the rights to the ice. That's a question I can never answer how anybody had the rights to a certain pond. What I think happened was that everybody worked together. You fill one ice house and stop filling the second ice house. They all worked together. You see it here now in mid Massachusetts. This is a question. This is Black Pond again from kind of low looking over here. This was, uh, I think, the Robert's Ice House. There was a family event. All the kids showed up. You can see them the pipe poles. Even God was here. Black Pond at one time had seven ice houses on it at the same time. <coughs> this is the flower here. Cut the grooves in it. Deep and deeper. This is uh, Black Pond. This is Lake Crew Avenue in the background there. It's fairly recent, judging by the car. 1960. 1960. Yeah. This is Black Swan again. This is a uh, chase I saw that was really about. Maple Street up here. I had quite a few pictures of this area here. This is Maple Street, which turns right, goes up. So uh, what's the avenue? And this is the Euclid Avenue before the early 20s. You can see the nice right in back here. This was before they could punch the road through. And this area here, it was these houses. I'll come back to these houses back there. Again, another interesting pump tested. These houses here, these right here, they're still here today. The Chase Ice Company, the owner of Chase Ice, had two sons, and they were both then firefighters. One was a firefighter, and one eventually was the chief of Bob at Ed Chase. He was the chief from 1913-1931. And again, his father owned the ice company. And this is him now with his chief's car down on Union Street and Market Street, the old Bush Street Firehouse. So this is what the, the Chase Ice House looked like. It's quite large. It's a ramp going up there. You see the ice floating down to it. Eventually, break this up now into smaller pieces. These, well, these are planks here. The men were scaling these planks to get traction. Sometimes the ice was so slippery they couldn't pull the other pieces or large pieces of ice in. The ice cream into this canal here on the channel. The guy with the bar would break it into small pieces out here, working around the canal passenger. Break a bar. These guys get the hooks. A lot of help with us. You say you fall in? Oh, yeah, must you look all in. That's a must you break through. <laughs> this is a different view. Of the ice is a small piece of the going into the ice house. Eventually, you're like a ray of health. Here, they put on like a ray of health. Like an upside down ray of health. This must be the 
across the playground. <laughs> you can see the bars, see the books. Also, the ice was walking there into the ice house. This is about this is the top part of the bridge. This is they're coming back towards us. The bottom part is going up. We've got that like a right angle bar here. We broke up the ice lines. We bring it into the ice house. This is going to whatever level the ice was stored inside the house. And these gentlemen here get the ice off of there and pull it into the actually the ice off the top of the store. This is outside of the porch. <coughs> and we bring the ice in here. This is the almost the roof line now. You see the roof line coming up. They're putting the ice in and stirring it. Now they put about two feet of hay in our sawdust in here now. And they keep it covered like that to the time to sell it to the, the customers. This is the list of uh, the ice houses of 1932, I think it was. There was quite a few different ice companies in there. Yeah, they had the all the magazines. Absolutely pure ice. I saw some hostage walking on it. <laughs> <laughs> this office was on 333 Union Street, downtown, on the This is a bunch of ads from different ice companies. They all use the same picture. <laughs> I'm sure I think they all work together. What would a block cost? You yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very reasonable. How much? Oh, yeah. This is that, that, this is that uh, ice company in Union Street, 333 Union Street. Right in the middle of downtown Central Street of the ice company. Nobody gets the bonds. Again, that's on the side. I wait. I'm going to try to show you one of these. That's 833. The best ice to run was on one plate. That was the pure size of the one. Second plate. That was the best size. Little late. Little late. Believe what that is. One A. Yes. One. Right. 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 One A. This is the receipt. You asked how much it cost. This is for six dollars. It was for six months, from May to October. Six dollars it cost. We do it every day. Oh. 1890. 1890. 18 pounds of ice daily. 1894. What's the figure for ice? How many pounds of ice? 15 pounds of ice a day. Per 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 day. All kinds of ice wagons. You see them everywhere. You see them everywhere. All the streets along the city. Any of you folks know people from Lynn? It was an appliance store in Lynn. It was Duff. Company. This is the line of Duff. This is one of these characters here. This last looks pretty tired. <laughs> this is downtown on Union Street. This big building here in the background is the old Paramount Theater. It's pretty good line. There's an ice break in here, so see the trolley tracks, all the songs. This is Joy Studio, Iverson Street. This is Central Square before the elevator of the railroad. This is Union Street, this is uh, Central Square, Exchange Street up here. The old IP Island building over here. Um, yeah. the, the railroad was elevated in 1913, so this is prior to that. But the regular occurrence is the next way. With the invention of the refrigerator, the ice companies are becoming obsolete, and they started to trench out now. This is absolutely clear ice, but now the sun is moving in coke. It's been trenching out. I'm still trying to stay in business with uh, the outside company. This company here was ice pouring the wood. <coughs> ice range or <laughs> Now this was young here. Ice didn't even get top going anymore. It's full of coke first and the fuel. 
Ты что так делала? Ну. This shows the ice house that burned, the ice is still there, and the heat is still in the railroad tracks. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But there are a lot of pleasant memories too with the ice. The little ice guy with the brick window, the old fashioned ice box. <laughs> Nice stars, nice stars. Probably the most pleasant memories. The ice man came and gave a shave to the kids. Yeah, right. The first, very first slide I showed you was at Curry and Ives. Now you know it's not like a Curry Ives. That's my program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said to somebody you want to talk about your experience with the race. Somebody have a story you want to select one? Yeah, I like this one. I just, I have one. Okay, that's right. I don't. Okay. Get something to say? You know, the rest of the lights on? Yep. I just want to show you some pictures of myself. My name is Pop, Randy Pop. I live here in Lake Hill. I've been here for six years, 15 years. Uh, this picture was, this is a picture from the uh, Boston. I can't see the glasses on. It's a photographing section of the Boston. And, uh, February 15th, 1939. This is an ice cop in here, and this is a meeting and everything.
We've got a wealth of information. Now what we can see when he's Elder. I'm a big believer in being sure people here. All right. Enough to know. My question, go back over what you made, please, is that if we have a pawn, you have seven houses, ice houses around it, and I think you said it was really no one has the rights to the ice. I get out there with my whole family, maybe I can clear that hot wall before the McGill gets to how did they actually do it? Where are you going to put it? In my ice house. Oh, yeah. But now, you can okay. do it by yourself. So I believe, again, I don't know how they give up the point. I think everybody worked together. They fill this house, they fill this house. We all were full. There was enough ice, in other words. Okay, now we got seven ice houses. I want to put number eight on there. They say nothing doing. Is there not enough ice? Okay, I don't know how they give up the point. I have no idea. I just assume they all work together. Because there's something that you showed that says somebody had the ice rice. He read a two to a book. He had the exclusive rights for points in the New England area. I don't know how we get to that right though. I can't find it anywhere. I don't have all kinds of research. Once again. You know people in high places. Yeah. Judy, what's up? Um, okay. One of the shares I think it was a blue easier for the people that were listening. The ice houses were as wide as this building and doubled the depth and three stories high with no support on the inside. Like an empty shoebox that was then filled with ice. And so when they did burn or collapse, there wasn't anything to support them. And the reason I know that is my brother and I used to play in an ice house in July and August when we would go to northern Maine. And it would be up as far as the ceiling, filled with piles of ice and covered with sawdust. And we'd play tag inside that ice house because it was the co most comfortable place to be. <laughs> but I mean, it was just a rectangle with no inside which you know, and, they, and they're huge. That's why they have the braces on the side. So they have a strong weapon to go over. Right now you'd see salt sheds that are similar to ice houses because they yes, have, the have buttresses yeah. on the outside. Yeah, now they're in the steel though. So when I was at DPW, I used to design the uh, salt sheds and it's the same thing. So much natural water to replace What's the question? The ponds produce that much water that will come back. And yeah, the streams would feed into it, and the snow would melt. And also, yeah. the, um, <coughs> are you saying with the, the ice wasn't thick enough? So, where the water comes from? It's in the ice. Yeah. That would be it. Yeah. As far as thickness is concerned, just to throw in something Barbara Drozik told told us this last year. May I repeat your story, Brian? When you would skate down at the Pillage Pond ice house was on the cove on the sand. In fact, I think at uh, some Crooks house, there's still part of the uh, foundation there, I'm not sure. But apparently, according to Bravo, they would, would cut that ice and just in the, in the cove. If it wasn't thick enough, it would then re-sunk. Until it became thick, it was sunk and then re-frozen. Am I right? And uh, that's the way they brought theirs up. Yeah, but I think it was all locally sold ice. That ice scraper I showed you, they did scrape maybe three, four, five times a season. Every time it snowed, they had to get the snow. So it wasn't done just once. John? Hey, quick question. I noticed the horses uh, on the, uh, the ice and all. Did they have special shoes to keep the traction? I can only assume so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One thing that the ladies would relate to, which I don't think there's anyone old enough here to remember, one of the chores, you got the icebox, usually the icebox was very close to the back door. Right? And, the, and the problem was that the ice melted. It collected in a tray underneath, and if you didn't remember to empty the tray, it had water spilled all over the place. My father made an invention. It was copied by all the relatives. He rigged a funnel underneath, put a hose on it, 
drilled a hose through the side of the house and had it drip out. And out. That was the greatest invention for the house. Is that a patent Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Second floor. Fell in the ground. Yes, right. uh, it was a nice house on uh, Sunsaw, and you look at the old map. I, I can't remember, though I'm very ancient, and so on. Uh, but it was down about in back of where the tennis court is now. And uh, this is from the map, and there was a spur railway railroad from the ice house up to. 128, because 128 was the railroad bed, for the railroad too. And I guess I took it off a map, it was 1897 or something, 1887. It's in, it's in that Lindfield book, which I forgot to bring. There was the ice house there. I don't know whether any other ice houses, I don't think so. It was all privately owned around, around some talk itself. But as you said, Wenham, the ice from Wenham, the you know, people brag about it up there. And would that be Queen Victoria wanted that ice and so on? Yeah. Well, there's a big oh, ice house in Unquiet Power, Don. Yes, that one. Did you burn the, who burned that one down? The Quiet Power one was down the back of where the church is now. Right? And it was still around in 1950. What, did you take ice off? Did the Round family take ice off? <laughs> I don't think you can name a place where there wasn't ice. Cause it was May I ask uh, how do you keep ice from not sticking when you say it's a little in between? No sawdust between the big blocks of ice? No. Well, why wouldn't you put two pieces of ice together and they'll adhere, wouldn't you say? Again, one cube of ice would keep the next cube cold. Therefore, it wouldn't melt at the lower level. Oh, so it wouldn't melt yeah, to make that layer The whole place like was it. cold. And it wouldn't melt. So the edges would melt, not the middle part. Well, you don't have to have the sawdust. You see the sawdust for one On top? On top. Yeah. One thing, they shipped ice from here. They started like kind of an alley bit in the slope where the boat where they came from. They started shipping it by sailing ship down to the Caribbean which is only six or seven days by school. They packed it with sawdust for the same thing. You fill the hole with ice, now you got hundreds of tons of ice, you pack sawdust around the outside, they lost about 5% maybe. Then they started shipping it further out. They wound up sending it to India, which is like 230 days in a sailing ship. And they'd get there, and they'd not lose more than 5 or 10%. But the thing about the Wenham Lake ice, because Wenham Lake ice was now recognized in England and India and South Africa and every place as being the best ice, all the ice that went over there was Wenham Lake ice. Even though Wenham Lake produced, say, 50,000 tons of ice, they shipped 2 million tons. <laughs> That's merchandise. Like Kobe beef. If you have an ice box and a hunk of ice in the ice box, it's keeping your milk and fruit cold. So you have a hunk of ice to keep any other ice cold. It just compounds like that. One hunk of ice keeps you out of An illustration of, uh, of how um, slow it is to melt. I had the two stories. In my, in my youth, I taught school in South Paris, Maine. Boy, was I green. But next to us in Norway were the companies that made dowels out of birch. We made dowels and, and uh, lollipop sticks and uh, uh, the thread and soil and so forth. They made out of butch, birch. In the wintertime, the locals go out and cut the birch, white birch, they cut them this way, and then they'd go stack them in the yard, and they would cover them with snow. They'd keep piling snow on them so that they wouldn't leach or bleach or leach for as much as anything or stain. And I was up there in August, and they were still pulling logs out of the snow. And so, <laughs> and also while I was there, they were cutting out of Norway Lake, a big ice house, and there was a regular production of cutting ice there. They were out with jeeps and saws and everything like that. <coughs> but it was a huge production. But you mentioned that book on the postcard we sent out to two books of good reading. And they're both very, very good books. I have one of them. The one about Tudor shows how this Yankee really cornered the business. 
And the ice, New England ice went all around the world. And of course, it's the most green production you can have. Why don't we do it today? <laughs> but my children, but there must be much more than all. Doc, you're still on the floor. It was one of the safest trips you could take on a sailing vessel, full of ice because it just couldn't sink. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay. The ice floats. Is that why it has ice floats, right? Yeah, it would, put, it would fill up the hole with water, but the ice would float. That would keep the whole boat afloat. No, good. Mr. Bonnerman, can I ask you a question? I was working on the cleanup of uh, uh, Lindgate Motors on Boston Street. And we were doing an excavation. And unfortunately, Lindgate had had a release. That they, they had an MDC trap, but the, the pipe broke. So all the oil that they used to use to um, you know, service the vehicles and everything ended up in the ground. And the other this huge excavation. And we had called Dick say we had made sure we didn't hit any water lines, gas lines, anything like There's that. There's a stream right behind you, right? Strawberry Well, Brook. a stream. What's the name of the stream? Strawberry Brook. Okay. Strawberry Brook was somehow diverted into this big pipe. And the pipe was like a pressure, pressure pipe. And the excavator hit the pressure pipe. And the, it filled up the whole area with water. And to this day, I don't understand how that would have happened. but. Strawberry Brook goes from Flax Pond to someplace else. Mm -hmm. it, it was like amazing. It was like it was like hitting a pressure main, and it was the brook. The whole brook was squeezed into the eight-inch pipe. That'd be or something. Yeah, and uh, the the excavator operator knew enough to go to uh, Waterworks and Malden and get one of these clamps that you just hold over and then you clamp it up and clamp it up. I could never figure out how that happened. Thank you.